Okay, welcome everyone. This is Jonathan Lip from the Big Apple Film Festival. Welcome to our final conference of the day. So as everyone knows at this point, we've been discussing um, ideas on production and uh, distribution, as well as financing independent films, uh, screenwriting, uh, strategies for getting an agent, optioning and selling scripts, etc. cetera. Um, so for our final conference of the day, we have with us our guest, Tara Mealy. Uh, who is a writer director and um, let's see, I believe she is here. Um, let's see, there she is. Hi. Hi, good to see you. Thank you so much for being here. Of course. Hi, thanks for having me. Cool. All right. So this is Tara Mealy and thank you. And um, just to give a brief background. Uh, so Tara is the uh, director of Wander Darkly, which um, screened at Sundance, and it stars uh, uh, Sienna Miller, who's a Golden Globe nominee, as well as Diego Luna, who could be seen in the show uh, Rogue One, uh, Star Wars story, which is um, going to be premiering on Disney+. Plus. Um, Tara is also attached to write a Carol Burnett biopic, um, which is being produced by Tina Fey for Apple, and Tara also has quite a bit of experience directing for television, shows like Green Arrow for The CW, Batwoman, Hawaii Five-0, Arrow on Netflix, um, so that's sort of my brief intro, but um, Tara, yeah, if you can give us just a little background on yourself, um, just, you know, so I know I just said, you know, said a, a few of the titles. You did such a good job. You did such a good job. Um, no, I'm actually a New Yorker originally I'm from Long Island. Um, I live in LA now. Um, yeah, you know, I was a theater brat, like all growing up. I did, uh, uh, you know, youth theater and regional theater and really loved connecting with an audience as an actor. Um, I went to college at UCSB for acting originally, and there was a like a really um, small BFA program there. Um, and it just didn't quite click for me. I felt like I'd like paid all this money to go to college and and was like still playing at camp. You know, I didn't feel like it was quite what I what I was looking for. And I kept finding myself like in the, you know, uh, the student uh, job center, like looking at film and TV stuff. And nobody in my family has any connection to the business at all. Um, and then I, I saw a student film series and it just sort of occurred to me, it was like just these little black and white prints rolling through, you know, with splice tape and everything. And I thought, oh my God, somebody made that. Like I could make that. And it was just this real aha moment, like a lighthouse beam, like hitting me from the screen. Um, and I was hooked. I was really hooked. So my first student film went to slam dance in 2000. So it took me 20 years. I, I said this at Sundance, it took me 20 years to get down the mountain to uh, Sundance. Um, certainly a winding road and definitely, you know, when I graduated college, um, you know, I had a lot of projects that just couldn't get financed with me as a director, as a woman. And at the time, I think I, I would have been very hesitant to say, I would never have said that. I, I think it just would have come off as sour grapes. It's hard for everybody. Um, but once the numbers sort of came out and me too, and times up happened, um, it, it really changed just like a door on the playing field opened and I was like allowed to compete. And so um, my career really changed in like the past, you know, 10, 10 years, I would say, like um, I started doing like I did a micro budget indie feature and then I did a bunch of lifetime movies back to back off of that. And then I wrote Wander Darkly. I was sort of like, can't do this anymore. I got to go back to my roots and start writing and figure out what I have to say. And yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you say that, um, you know, you were at Slamdance in 2000 and then 20 years later at Sundance, because, you know, very often in this business, people hear stories about someone who was 20 years old and made a movie. And then all of a sudden the next day they were rich and famous. So yeah, it's nice that they hear that, you know, and the reality is, yeah, I mean, it takes a very long time and there's a lot of obstacles along the way. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm going to, uh, we'll get into some questions and um, any of the participants, if you have questions, um, please put them into the Q&A box and we'll, we'll get to as, as many questions as we can. Uh, but first, let me ask you, you know, you, you had mentioned you had started with acting. Was that, is that right? You started. So, so how did you, or when did you sort of make the decision that you wanted to be behind the camera rather than uh, as, as you an actor? You know, it's interesting. I mean, I think the, the first thing to note is that acting is often the only thing we see, right? As kids, when we're looking at a storyteller, right? Like the actor's the only vehicle that you actually can look at and say, oh, like if you can see it, you can be it. Like, I wanna be that part of it. Um, my first job as an assistant director in theater was when I was 14. So I started like assistant directing the plays for the littler kids when I, you know, as opposed to the teen shows, I was like working that way. And I really loved that. Um, and then when I was, even when I was in the acting program, I started doing directing on the theater side, but I really didn't like directing theater because 
you lose all control. I mean, like I, I realized what film has made me realize about myself is how OCD I am and how much I love that control and manipulation. You can make, give someone a feeling that you can project a feeling from yourself through a screen and hand it to someone. But when you're doing theater, you're really handing it all off to your actors and asking your actors to do more of that work. And so, um, and it's also so temporary, you know, it's like, I would do this show and everybody would be like, oh yeah, we, we heard that was really good. And I'm like, you'll never know, like, you'll never see it. <laughs> like, it's so like ethereal, you know? So, um, so yeah, it was like, once I, I mean, I just took my first film class and, and it just, it definitely clicked something with me that was the, the nerdy engineering part that comes from my dad, the writer, you know, storyteller that comes from my mom. And it was like these wonderful like uh, pieces made whole for me where I could be geeky and geek out about story. So when you, when you first um, started taking your first, first film classes, were there certain types of films you knew you wanted to make or did certain directors or, or films inspire you that sort of you wanted to emulate in, in a way? Oh, you know, maybe not when I first, when I, I guess when I first started out, I felt a lot more influenced by theater. Like I was really into sort of like absurdist comedies and theater. And then um, the first short that I directed was actually a horror short based on a story written by Charles Beaumont. Um, I will say what I realized early on is that like, I liked to have a lot of style. Like I wanted to do things with the camera. I didn't want to just have like talking heads and be verite. Like I didn't respond to the French new wave. Like that wasn't what I liked. I liked movies that were um, transforming worlds and moving time and space and that were using the, the cinema to, to do things you couldn't do as easily in the theater. Um, mm -hmm. So, so, so yeah. So even in the beginning, you know, like I was watching like Maya Darren and being like, that's amazing. Like she, you know, you walk into the camera and then you walk out and you're in a different location. It was like the origins of using a cut to jump worlds. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I think pretty early on, I was interested in that. So you had started um, with a horror short. So um, have you ever, like, did you want to pursue horror at all? Or was that just for... Uh it was, it was, yeah, it was sort of like what was available to me. Like I had told the department I wanted to pitch on like one of the four prestigious projects they do every year. And my film advisor was really smart. And he said, you know, because you're just coming in from the theater department, maybe hook up with some people that already have a movie that are like further along. And so he hooked me up with these producers who had this short that was a, uh, based on a short story. Um, and I did react. I mean, I did respond to it. It was this really dark story about a woman who, gives birth to a boy, but she's so damaged by men that she raises him as a girl and he grows up and is questioning who he is. It's like, it was a really fun little Twilight Zone kind of episode. Um, but I, I think I recognize that I could have fun with it. I like, you know, and, and the other thing I will say is I'm such a good audience for a horror movie. Like I almost hate to watch them because I get way too scared. Like I saw Poltergeist. My parents let me see Poltergeist in the theaters when I was like three years old. Uh -huh. It was like so dumb, you know, they were very young. Um, and I think it really like scarred me maybe in good and bad ways. Like, cause uh -huh. I think it's actually pretty great cinema. Like if you look back at how real that family feels and some of the things that that movie accomplishes are incredible. So short answer, uh, no, I don't like making horror movies but they're really fun to make, which is yeah. a funny thing. Like, like it's not the thing I want to make in the world, but they're really fun to make. Yeah. So, did, and let me let me uh, again. If anybody has questions, just put them right into the Q and A box, and uh, we'll answer them. Um, did the short films that you made help you in making your first feature in terms of like getting the financing, proving that you can direct something, getting into film festivals? Did the shorts kind of play play a role in that? Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, the first feature I made was a hundred thousand dollar feature, right? And we made it in 15 days uh, in a house that the producer owned on Lake Michigan. Mm -hmm. And we went out to a bunch of people who she knew that, you know, would understand that they probably weren't going to make their money back, that there's more like an art donation than anything else. Yeah. And being able to have a, a presentation, which was like, okay, so here's Tara's first short, here's her second short here's, I had the script, right? Like I had written the script to myself. Mm -hmm. I would say probably writing the script gives you more leverage than even having done short films. Mm -hmm. um, I had a lot of mentors early on tell me you have to write, you have to just write. Like if you want to direct, you have to get, you have to have that leverage and you own the property and then that's your leverage. Yeah. Um, yeah but I, I definitely think it's worth doing shorts, you know? I mean, 
it's a great place to figure yourself out with a, yeah. lot, a lot less stakes and a, a lot. It's like doing a sprint instead of a marathon, you know, like. Yeah. Well, do you think there's um, a market for shorts outside of just using it as a, I was going to say just, but outside of using it as a calling card, um, you think there's a, a, like an actual market for it, a place to distribute them and perhaps even recoup your costs? You know, it's been a long time since I've been in that world. So I don't know now, like what that market's like. I don't, I did have an agent a few years ago, like before I did Wander Darkly. And I was kind of frustrated that I wasn't getting more like directing help from him. He was like, you should do a short. And I was like, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> like I've done three features. I'm not doing a short. And then I actually ended up making a, a viral video after that. I did meet a Muslim in, five years ago. And it went viral. It went insanely viral. Like 45 million people saw it. Mm. And I'd already left that agent. And I probably owe him a like, you maybe were right. You know, I owe him like a little Mia Culpa email. Um, mm. and, and I didn't recoup from that because I did that for, you know, uh, you know, just to do that. I thought it was the right thing to do. And it helped my career probably more than anything I've ever done. Because William Morris signed me off of that. And really, I was like, yeah, so yeah, it was crazy because I showed it to Lynette Hal Taylor, who's a producer. And she was like, oh, we should show this to Graham Taylor, who's her husband, who was at the time an agent at William Morris. And then he was like, this is great. Like, let's make this go viral. And I was like, okay, I was just going to put it on my Facebook page, but like, yeah, we should do that. And wow. then he sent it to Ari Emanuel and then Ari Emanuel sent it to like every agent at the agency and was like, this is our new client and like, let's support her. So it was like this beautiful thing. Cause I, I didn't do it for that. You know, it's like, a maybe a good reminder. I hate what everyone's always like, you have to create smart. You have to create for the market. You have to know your audience. You have to, da, da, da. like, it's always this talk of like, as an artist, you've got to be somehow thinking for 5 million other people instead yeah. of like getting everybody to get out of your office, get out of your head and really get quiet and be like, what's essential? What do I have to say? What do I want to say before I die? What do I want to say? You know, like, because maybe what your truth is, is going to be somebody else's truth too. Like maybe the thing that you actually really care about for you will mm -hmm. matter to other people. It's maybe. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, you know, because, you know, most of the time you hear how, a lot of the, the questions are, how do you get an agent? And very often we hear that, you know, they were, somebody was in a big film festival or they mm -hmm. won a big screenplay competition, but this is interesting from a, a YouTube video which is another option that we don't, we don't talk about that. We have a lot of these conferences. We don't talk about it that much, but um, so how do you make a video go viral? Like what was done to, to push it along to get to a point yeah, of so, 5 million? Yeah. I mean, I have to say I didn't do it right. Like I, it was a, a team effort from a, a, a group of agents at William Morris, Chris Slager really helmed it. I mean, he was like, uh, I, I know there was like a team of people who were like, here's the strategy. It was like, we're releasing it on this day. It was like the start of Ramadan. Uh -huh. And it was, we were maybe a month and a half out and we made a plan. It was like, we're gonna send it before the drop day. We're gonna send it as a quiet release to uh -huh. these hundred influencer people. I mean, we sent it to like the head of the human rights watch and to Hillary Clinton's people and Barack Obama's people. And like they, so they had all those contacts. Like, I don't, I don't happen to know like, Barack yeah. Obama's right hand woman, you know? Yeah. So, um, and they sent it to all those people and said, Hey, we really care about this. Would you please share it on this day at this time in this way? And here's what you can say. Like, you know, we are all Muslim or like whatever the things were that we came up with these lines and it was like, hashtag meet a Muslim. Yeah. So, so that was one piece of it. And then refinery 29 actually ended up picking it up and putting mm -hmm. it on their Facebook page. And then that was really where it like blew up. So oh. It was like a combination. It was just a real, it was a plan. I think, look, there's definitely things where like a dad and his daughter are being cute and he puts it up on his thing and it just yeah. catches fire. Yeah. But that's, that's not what this one was. Yeah. So how did, well, first of all, let me ask you, um, how would you, Refinery29, what is their, what would you say is their, their main function? Like what, if, if a filmmaker is interested in approaching Refinery29? Yeah, I mean, I think they tend to do content for women and it tends to be more like pop culture and fashion and style and stuff. So it was sort of interesting that like, they like put this on their site and, you know, it was very controversial. Like a lot of people were in, in response to it, which made you just think, oh, we, I'm glad we did it. Like the, obviously this is a conversation that had to be had, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and again, uh, if anybody has questions, throw it in the Q and A box, feel free to join. Um, so the, um, 
the uh, the viral video. Um, so y- you had said that uh, there was a team of people. So when you said that the influencer shared it, did they share it like on, you mean like on Twitter and yes, Facebook, exactly. like on their platforms? Exactly. exactly. And then did Refinery29 find it on its own or was it recommended to them for? It was recommended to them. I had a commercial agent that I was working with at the time and she sent it to them. Okay, cool. All right, so let me just jump over to the Q&A box here. So um, we have a question from, from Joshua. Question is, in this industry that is so transformed by digital streaming services, do you think it is better to make content available online for free? In our case, web episode by web episode, building up a larger following, or is it better to charge money or to finish production of season one and shop it around to distributors? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming, is it 22 minute episodes? Can he answer that? It's like it's like a traditional like length, or is it just short form like little mini episodes? Uh, let's see. Are they, um, Josh? If you want to type that in, uh, I mean, yeah. I'll, I'll just say this much. So, oh, like you said, they're ten, 10 minute episodes. Ten minute episodes. So, yeah. I don't know. Like, like again, like I haven't done short form like that. So I don't know exactly what the market looks like for like a series of 10, 10 minute episodes. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you're just starting out, like I, I had a very specific thing. I didn't want anyone to have to watch an ad for me to Muslim or feel like it was sponsored by whatever vodka, you know, like it just, I didn't want it connected to anything and I didn't want to make money on it. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we released it that way, which probably helped it go viral, right? Because you could just have it. You didn't have to watch a commercial before you didn't like, you could just share it. Um, and everybody could use it. In fact, we had to go back on a music license that we had gotten. Um, like a guy mentions Kelly Clarkson in it or something. And then we had this song at the end that was like a joke. And I had to like say, it's not that funny. Let's take it out so we can just share it because we couldn't get her song to be free for in perpetuity forever. Um, so I think it depends on where you're at in your career. Like if you can trade the very probably small amount of money you're likely to get for the the chance at exposure and a little cred, then I would say trade it. You know, like I often try to make decisions based on, well, what would I do if I was rich? Mm -hmm. Like I would probably take that great opportunity that doesn't pay a lot instead of the shitty job that actually will pay me. But, you Mm -hmm. know, so I'm always trying to make those decisions. Like what are the rich people doing? Right. So you're saying like, look at the bigger picture, not like the short term, not the short term. Right. That's exactly right. So yeah, with it, with a sh- speaking about YouTube, would you put um, a short film on YouTube to try to gain attention as a director? Uh, rather, I mean, I know you did a video, but in terms of like, let's say you want to be a feature film director, like you're the short horror film you made. Do you think YouTube is a good platform for a, like a traditional short film? I don't know. I mean, I feel like most of the filmmakers that I know are using Vimeo instead of YouTube. But mm-hmm. honestly, like, I feel like, I'm like the worst person to ask, you know, it's like, I should ask like my 11 year old, like they're constantly like, mom, you don't know shit, you know, <laughs> like my kid. So I don't know, maybe you have to put it on like TikTok, like in like short <laughs> bursts, right? Like, yeah, I don't know. Honestly, I don't know the answer to that. Right. So um, the, your first feature that went to slam dance. Um, that you- was a short. Oh, a short. short went to slam- my student okay. film. So your, your first feature, you mentioned that there was one where there was a budget of around a hundred thousand. Yes. Yeah. So that was in 2009. Okay. So something like that, like a hundred thousand is very low budget for a film. However, for the average person, it's quite a large sum of money. So let's yeah. say somebody is making a film with a, with a approximately a $100,000 budget. Where would one start to get financing? Crowdfunding, yeah. private investor, what, what, what route yeah. would you think is... The best okay, so, so we did this, we did this right before, like maybe a year or two before Kickstarter became a thing. Mm-hmm. And my producer was really smart. I mean, she had family friends in Michigan who she knew were supporters of the arts. She, um, they were like fa- friends of her father's and we did this huge presentation for them. I mean, it was basically a pitch that, you know, art film and independent cinema needs like patrons. And that we, we could take the experience we had gained and create something that may or may not recoup, but would be worthwhile in the world. And here was why. Mm -hmm. Um, And we raised the money that way. And, and we raised a ton of soft money too. Like 
I mean, everybody worked for so little. Yeah. We, um, like our editor used his own computer and he was like a big editor who did us the favor to cut it. You know, um, we posted it all for like almost nothing at a, a post. House. Like you can get a lot of soft money. Like, you know, a camera house will hook you up. Um, like uh, probably you can find somebody to color correct it on the weekends or, you know, our, our situation was a messy situation, but also for free. It ends up being like your time is the thing that gets eaten, right? So like you're driving out to Simi Valley because some guy has like a monitor that's like some prosumer monitor that can color time on the laptop or something. You end up doing all these insane things just to get the movie made. Yeah. Um, but that's it. It's sort of like by hook or by crook. I mean, also like, you know, we didn't use lights. We decided to just use natural light um in the 15 days we were shooting and sometimes I love the look of that and sometimes in the movie I'm like oh it's so broken like we should have had a couple of lights you know like but um it was a lot of sacrifice to get it made at that at that level wow yeah um and then then your the the, the most recent wander darkly went to Sundance in 2020 yeah. um so of course, a lot of filmmakers would like to know how one gets into Sundance. I mean, of course, that's that's the big question when the, in the film festival world. So how did yeah. you, how did you go about that? Oh my God, like luck, man. You know, I don't know. I um I think you just can't anticipate what people are going to respond to, and I definitely felt like at Sundance, there's like a whole Sundance community and a whole Sundance world that. I had not been a part of prior to this, you know? So like there are filmmakers there who've been through all the labs and they had their short there yeah. and they like, they kind of feel like they're at home. I felt like I was not at home. I felt like I was like, oh my God, I'm here. I'm like vulnerable. I'm like, do I even fit in at Sundance? You know, like you feel all those insane feelings when you're there, or at least I did. I felt all that. Yeah. Um, so here's what I will say. I made the best movie I could. I had support of um, incredible producers. Um, they, I, I've often been in situations where by necessity, maybe producers have to say it's good enough. It's good enough, you know? Mm -hmm. And these producers really understood that good enough wasn't going to cut it. If you're going to cut through like the noise as, a, you know, as a low budget independent film, it has to be something else. It cannot just be, yeah, it was like a nice, like little low budget movie because you can't sell that. Like it has to make noise. It has to like stand out. So they always allowed me to keep going. Like, you know, it was like 70 versions of a VFX shot. And I'd be like, it just doesn't feel good. You know, how can we fix it? And they'd be like, okay, let's do one more. Let's get it right. You know? Um, and I think it's, you know, that comes from trust too. Like, I don't think I was like, it sounds like a lot, 70 versions, but you know, it's not studio level of versions for VFX shots uh, on some stuff. So yeah, I think, um, I don't know, I wanna say luck. I wanna say we worked really hard. I wanna say I really believed in the project and I accomplished something good. I think uh, it's hard to look at your own movies and think that they're good. <laughs> it's like listening to this Orson Welles interview the other day and he goes, no, I never watch my movies because that would be too depressing. <laughs> And I was like, yes, exactly. You always, you know, you always wanted to live in potential of what you thought it could be before you made it. Right, right. And, and, you know, one, one of the great things about um, about the film is that you have such an amazing cast. You have Sienna yeah. Miller, who is a Golden Globe nominee. Yes. And Diego yeah. Luna, right. who's going to be in this huge show on Disney Plus, um, you know, Rogue One. So I, the question is, how does a filmmaker just starting out um, attract name talent how do you get such a high profile cast attached especially if you're sort of just yeah. starting out your career yeah so i mean i would say it's all about the the script it really it all comes down to the script and like i was very lucky that my producers are much more experienced than i am you know like um lynette produced blue valentine at the beginning of her career she oh. produced um, a star is born recently, right? So wow. she is a reputable producer. People take her seriously. She does quality stuff and she was vouching for me. So, so that went a long way first, right? To just even get the conversation with the agents. Um, but we didn't even send the script to Sienna. Sienna's agent slipped the script to her. Um, we had had another actress attached and she fell out because of scheduling. And we already had Diego on and Diego and Sienna have the same agent. And so she had slipped it to Sienna. So it really was, you know, that with Diego too, it was like the quality of the script. And then, you know, you have to have this conversation. You're, they want to know who you are. They want to like, 
get on the zoom with you and be like, is this going to be a nightmare? Like are you cool. And what's your vision for this? And, and do I believe in you? And will I follow you into battle? And mm-hmm. when you swallow your nerves and have that conversation with these big stars who you respect and are intimidated by and um, be as honest as you can about what you think it should be and hope they respond. You know, um, I, I have felt really lucky like in that, uh, in my exchanges and my relationships and my conversations with actors about projects like that. Um, I think it's like, I think it's about connecting, really trying to connect with them and, and be like, come do this, you know, like, let's go play. Like, let's like, yeah. it shouldn't be, it should be the, the artist talking in those moments, you know, instead right. of the business people talking to get them, to get them interested. They did it for no money. You know I mean? It's uh-huh. like, yeah, that's amazing uh, that you really. Yeah, I mean that that's so great. It's it's funny you mentioned Blue Valentine. One of the uh, yeah Frederick King on tomorrow is one of our panelists. He oh, was a cool. Valentine as well. Um, so in terms of casting, um, would you recommend uh, a casting director? Do you think that that's very important when trying to get the right cast? So. In my experience, normally a casting director isn't isn't really who's getting your leads, like your your one or two leads. Like normally, they're filling out the whole rest of the cast. Mm-hmm. So, you have a casting director who like really believes in you and loves you and and is willing to kind of do that. Like that's great. But like right now, I have a pilot um, with Endeavor Content and Fifty One Entertainment, which is Lynette and Sam's company, mm-hmm. and we're you know, we're casting, like we're out, we're, we're the ones talking and having the conversations and going out to the agents and going out to cast. So we don't have a casting director on that yet, even though there are a lot of casting directors I love who I'm eager to work with. Mm -hmm. um, And our friends were like, we're just not at that step yet. But I suppose if you don't have a producer who has good contacts and a casting director is willing to do that lift, but it's a lot of work, you know, that's a lot of work. If if you have a certain um, cast member, uh, a certain, a certain actor in mind that you'd like to join your cast uh I, i'm if it's a you know a known actor um i'm assuming you yeah. have to go their agent or their manager or their publicist um what's the best way to approach their their rep how would you go about doing that yeah. um you know so it's interesting like in the the way that i work the producers are the ones that actually reach out to the agents but i often will write a letter to the actor um and it's often look you know you're often going out to people that you really love you know, like you hope, right. That you're going out to these people. So again, it's like, I think it's fair to, to tell them why you think they're so great, (laughs) why you think they'd be great for this. Like, um, what it is about them in particular that you respond to. I also find that like the specificity of your compliments speaks leagues about what you see as a director. Right. So like, you can't just be like, you're so good. You're so beautiful. I can't wait to have you in my movie. It has to be like, you know, um, something specific that they did in a performance that cracked your heart or that like you can see like the something about how they elevate work or whatever that thing is, whatever they're doing specifically, you know, that you want to call out so that they feel seen, right? Right, right. Yeah. Um, right. That That's interesting. And yes, yeah, so you're saying like, yeah, one specific, like, like if you, if you say I saw you in this moment in this film or on stage, it's yeah. kind of expressing that you know you that's you're you're making a very specific reason why. Yeah. You like I remember I said to Diego, I said something like, you know, I had been a fan of his for such a long time, and I thought he brought such like depth and like warmth to characters, even when they weren't always doing things that were necessarily likable, which I thought was really wonderful. Mm-hmm. And that I'd also seen this interview with him that after the earthquake in Mexico, he was like talking about how like all these buildings had fallen and they're in Mexico city. And he's like helping people out of buildings. And he like managed to make a joke where like he and somebody else on the street were managing to like find heart and humor in this moment. And I was like, and that is this character. Yeah. That exact thing of like rising above and using humor to like manage the darkness. That is exactly who this character is. And like, that's why I need you. And so it was like something really personal that, that you know. Right, right. And also there's a question in the Q&A box here um, asking how you got attached to a Carol Burnett biopic. 
-hmm. And if uh, you knew Tina Fey. Um, no, I did not know Tina until I pitched her and Carol. Um, but I am obsessed with both of them. I just think they're incredible icons and heroes of mine personally. So, um, yeah, I want to give like a lot of credit to my feature agent actually, because they, this project existed at focus and then, um, there was a draft and then they wanted to go in a different direction or something. And so, uh, Josh McLaughlin, who's the head of focus, uh, left and took this project with him. So it was like a book, it's based on a book and it has Steven Rogers attached as a producer. He wrote I, Tanya and is incredibly talented. And then Tina and Eric, her producing partner and Carol. So it's like a big team of producers with like no script and they were looking for a writer director and my agent had pitched me on it and Josh watched Wander Darkly and he said, I love the movie, but I just don't know that it's like the same movie. You know, like, I don't know that I see it as like an obvious comp, you know? And she was like, she just convinced him to meet with me um, because I was like, oh my God, Carol, <laughs> like, yes, like, please let me at this. Um, so I met with Josh and we really got along. We just really got on. And then he sent me the book and I read the book and I really, really responded to the book. Like it felt very personally, like, like this was something I needed to do. And um, I talked to him because I was sort of curious, like, you know, they'd all been on this project for a long time. It's Carol's life. There were other writers, like, what did they want to do? And he was so wonderful. He sort of said to me, look, we don't, we want to know what you want to do. We need to have an artist who will come in and define this film and, and make it their own. And I was like, oh, right. I can do that. Like that I can do. So I went away and got quiet and I just like, I found a way in. I just was like, it was just one of those things that I was like, I know exactly what this movie is. This movie is mine. I've always made this movie. Like this movie has always been mine. And so I called him back and pitched him and he really liked my take on it. And then I pitched him and Steven and Eric and they all really liked my take on it. And then I pitched Tina and Carol and they liked my take on it. And then I waited, that's the truth of it. Like I waited, I'm sure they met with a lot of other people. And then they sent me all the books. Like Carol has written like four books. And um, so I waited a long time and then they, they, you know, it was official. They wanted me to do it. And then we pitched to a bunch of studios, uh, you know, and, and uh, we had, you know, we, we had such a great experience with Apple that we went with Apple. And, um, and so now I'm writing. Yeah. Great. And when, when are, uh, when are you anticipating going into production? Do they have a set date yet? No, I don't even have a script yet. So we'll oh. just have to wait and see how it all shakes out once I finish and turn it in and see how, how many rewrites and how much development yeah. we do. Cool. And you've, you've directed a, um, quite a bit of television as well. Um, we were talking about before Arrow and uh, Batwoman and various shows. How does that differ from directing films? How, how, what's, how's the process differ? You know, it's so different. It's like, you know, you do a TV show and it's three weeks in and out. Um, you like, you are really, it depends on who you're working for, but you're much more of like a blocking camera manager where the showrunners really are the, they know the world. They like live and breathe the world. They know what the characters are going to do on, you know, three weeks and in three months and in three years and what they did three months and three weeks and three years ago. Mm. So you're just not the, the, the only captain, right? There's like a bigger captain like back there that you just have to defer to. Um, I like doing TV because it's really fun to dive into somebody else's world. It's almost like a totally different muscle, you know, like sprinting versus your own marathon. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's great practice and, and you get to play with big toys and there's uh, always a new challenge and there's always a new crew that does things in a slightly different way. And I really enjoy that piece of it. Um, in terms of like making your own, you know, your own film that you've written, that's your baby. It's, it's, um, it's both more harrowing and more gratifying. Um, and I think what's nice for me is like the balance of both. Um, it's nice to somehow take the pressure off of myself and come into somebody else's world and be like, I just like to play. Like, this is just fun to play. Yeah. And then to come back into my world, like, it's so important. I had to get it right. You know, it's like, it's a good reminder to, to lighten up a little bit for me. How do you, how do you get uh, the job directing 
shows like this. I mean, I'm, for anybody who's watching, who'd be interested in being a TV director or episodic streaming series, how do you get, get a job like that? Yeah. I mean, I can tell you how I got mine, you know, so after I did, um, uh, the Lake effect, which was the hundred thousand dollar movie, I got hired by Mar Vista entertainment to do three lifetime movies back to back. Like they make, like they call them co-pro. So it's like a little budget, like between 400 and 800,000, I think I was at to make these movies. Um, and it's really small. I mean, you're shooting like 13, 14, 15 days. Um, often like most of the budget goes to like, a, you know, an actor, like a name actor. Um, and they don't expect you to like post it the way that you would post a proper feature. Like they expect you to be more like a TV director, but I didn't do that. I was always trying to make like a movie. I yeah. didn't get a lot of movies. So I was like, this is all I have, you know? So anyway, so I did three of those, but I did give those like my best. I refused to just be like, oh, I'll just, it's a crappy movie. I'll just get the money. And like, you know, I, yeah. I really worked on those movies. And then, um, you know, uh, I got into the CBS directing program mm -hmm. and, and I did the Ryan Murphy program and I shadowed a ton. Um, mm -hmm. And when I wanted to get into TV, I'm, you know, because I'm a writer also, and I was on the picket line, I know a lot of TV writers. So I basically called every single TV writer I knew. And I said, you're doing it so well. And I want to get into TV. And can I take you to lunch? And can I pick your brain? And can I shadow your show? And can I get near your show? Yeah. Um, and that's sort of like how I got my first shadow on Castle. Um, Andrew Marlowe and Terry Miller gave me a shot to shadow. And then because I had shadowed, um, I was able to do the CBS program. Also because Marvista let me go DGA for my last feature because I wasn't going to do it. And they were like, what if we make you DGA? And I was like, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so I did the CBS program and then they sent me out. Uh, Glenn Geller was president at the time and he was so sweet. Uh, he was like, you need more action on your reel. Like go shadow Hawaii Five O. And I was like, bro, Hawaii mm. Five O is not gonna hire me. Like that's bananas. <laughs> and I also sort of was like frustrated because I'm sure you guys know this, you know, you do the programs and you either have to take time off of work or you aren't working and then you're not getting paid and you're doing this program for free and you're like, I'm gonna starve or get kicked out of my apartment. Um, and so it can be kind of stressful even though they're like, we're sending you to Hawaii for nine days. And you're like, I'm gonna die. I'm, I can't pay my electric bill. Like, you know, so it's this weird thing. Anyway, I went to Hawaii and um, Brian Spicer, the producing director there was really, really supportive. And I learned a lot from him. And he um, gave me a shot. So I went and I did my first episode for them. And then the day I turned in my cut, they were very happy. And then I got my second episode right away. They had a director drop out and they gave it to me. So it was sort of like a kiss. Like it's like a blessing as a director. I've seen line producers go through lists of resumes and be like, oh, they only have one episode of each show. Don't hire them. That means they've never been asked back. Oh. So you like getting a second was like a real like thing for me. And then um, a friend of mine who was an intern, I interned for Jodie Foster when I was uh, right out of college. And a friend of mine who interned with me was show running Arrow. And I'd been bugging her like, hey, you're doing TV. I really want to work in TV. I want to work with yeah. you. you know? And so after I did my two five O's, she called me up and was like, hey, you should come do this show. We had a director fall out and you should come do it. So, um, so yeah, it's like those happy accidents, right? Where people who you start off with as a student 20 years later are the people who will, you know, be working at high levels who can, can give you a job. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, so if anybody has any final questions, uh, we just have a few minutes here. So just put it right into the chat box. If you have uh, a final question. Um, and in the meantime, uh, I would just want to wrap this up by asking you if you could just tell us um, a bit about Wander Darkly, about the film. Yeah, um, Wander Darkly is uh, inspired by a true story. Um, uh, eight years ago, my husband and I survived a pretty bad car crash. And I had this moment afterwards where I thought I died um, and that like my kids be raised by my mom. And it just was this very strange concussed reaction that I had to the, the car accident. So um, our story follows a similar thing that this couple is sort of on the verge of uh, you know, breaking up and and the, the woman believes that she's died after this car accident. and. Uh, Mateo, her boyfriend, has to convince her that she's very much alive. And, and they, um, in order to do that, he sort of tells her their story. And they, they take this journey through their own memories and sort of rewrite their history and negotiate their history. Right. And, and fall back in love, you know. Cool. And, and where can Wander Darkly be seen? 
Yeah, um, it's on Hulu right now for free if you got Hulu. Otherwise, I think you can buy it on Apple and Amazon and all those places. Cool. And it's distributed by Lionsgate? Yeah. All right. That's awesome. Yeah, congratulations. Okay. Yeah. So I want to thank you. Again, this is Tara Mealy, writer, director. And uh, I want to thank our participants for being here today. Tara, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. And um, we're looking forward to seeing more of your films. Definitely can't wait for the Carol Burnett biopic. That's going to be awesome. Yeah, <laughs> It was so nice chatting with you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.